We are joined today by Lindsay Myers, um, who will be our guest speaker. Um, Lindsay, apart from a short period of time, um, working in a further education college at the start of her professional career, has spent the last 27 years working in UK universities. Uh, she has worked as a subject librarian both at the University of Plymouth and later at York, and as a library collections development team manager at the University of Hull. Lindsay has also worked in two York research units, the Social Policy Research Unit, a leading UK Centre for Applied Health and Social Care, Care Research, and the Centre for Reviews and Dissemination, which specialises in evidence synthesis to inform health policy and practice. Lindsay's current role is an open research li librarian at the University of York, a role that she has worked in since 2014. Um, although, as Lindsay said, uh, the job title has changed. So this was a short intro of Lindsay. And um, if that's all right, Lindsay, um, I don't know whether you have um, any slides to share. Um, I can give you any rights if you need. Yes, please. I do have some slides to share. Yes. Um, let's see. Okay, so hopefully uh, you'll now see the share screen. Yes. Yes, yep. Brilliant, you thank my you. My slides, can you hear me okay as well? Brilliant, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Magdalena, and thank you for inviting me to talk to you this morning, and sorry for the very long introduction. That seems to be what comes of being around for too long. Um, so I'm Lindsay Myers. I'm in the Open Research team as an Open Research Librarian. So just a little bit of information about the University of York, and that's not York University. We sometimes get confused with York University, and that's in Canada. Um, so I'm at the University of York. It opened in 1963. It's a Russell Group member, so that means it's one of 24 research intensive universities in the UK. In 2018-19, we had 86 million income from research. It's organised into three faculties, so that's Arts and Humanities, Social Science and Sciences. This is a fairly new concept actually here at York. And under those three faculties are 28 departments and schools. And within that are these two independent of, so independent of research units. Excluding professional and support staff, there are just over 2,000 academic research and teaching staff, and of those, 731 are staff on research-only contracts. So that's staff working almost exclusively on original or applied research. And this academic year, we've got just over 1,300 postgraduate research students. So I work in the open research team and that's a team of four individual posts, but five people. So we have a manager, there's two open research librarians, myself and a colleague, and we have a research data and output specialist post. So this is a job share. So it's one post, two people. And the team sits within the section called content and open research. So that's a team that kind of in now and in previous years has actually been managing kind of things like purchasing, reading lists, subscriptions, digitization, interlending and cataloging. So we work more kind of broadly with the rest of the team. So for example, we work with our metadata team and they're on a rotor to do checks around uh, metadata for recorded data sets. And we work with subscriptions team as well in terms of paying um, article processing charges from our York Open Access Fund. And sometimes we even pay for transformative agreements with publishers. So I think as you can imagine, as an open research team, we work in a broad um, field and broad number of areas. So in essence, the open research team works in partnership with academic and research staff and with postgraduate research students, but also with other staff facilitating research. Um, 
essentially what we're doing is providing guidance and training to help staff and postgraduate research students to plan, publish, preserve and share their research. So that includes everything relating to open research across the whole research life cycle, but more specifically research data management and open data, open access publication. And at the moment, we're working really hard on getting our REF, so that's the um, research excellence uh, framework submission submitted. Uh, we help people with copyright awareness, which are research related. We help people with finding and interpreting bibliometric data for research outputs, creating scholarly profiles. So that's all here, Google Scholar Profiles, Scopus. And we work around our repositories as well, which we share with the universities of uh, Sheffield and Leeds. So quite early on when we formed uh, this new group um, of supporting research staff and students, we decided that although we cover a broad range of things, actually we'd all have to kind of pick an area of expertise and specialism. And my area of expertise is in research data management. And I've listed here the kind of things that we're offering around research data management support and guidance. And I'm sure these are the kind of things that you're all offering. So it's advice and guidance, so web pages, uh, providing guidance on good practices and signposting to tools and sources of advice, dealing with inquiries, offering one to one consultations, uh, providing talks and guidance to particular groups, whether that be our departments or research groups, groups of staff or postgraduate research students, and that includes student induction. We provide support around uh, helping people to meet their requirements around research data management and potentially publishing and sharing their data. So that uh, could be the requirements that are set out in the university's research data management policy or if they have to meet funder data policies. In terms of data management plans, we do have a York data management plan template, and this is included in DMP online. And we added customized guidance to DMP online some time ago. And I also undertake uh, data management plan reviews and provide feedback so people can either click on the button in DMP online to send their uh, data management plan to me for feedback, or they can send it via email. The other things we offer, we offer um, something called Research Data York. So this is a service for University of York researchers to deposit data that needs to be retained for the long term. And we make it available to others as appropriate. And we do things like minting DOIs for deposits so they can include that DOI in their data access statements. Uh, the university is actually to deposit in a subject specific repository or as required by the funder, but I'm sure you all recognise that it's not always possible to find a suitable home for data. So this is where uh, Research Data York Service steps in and provides a home for uh, people to deposit their data. In terms of training, um, offer quite a bit of training actually. Uh, at least twice a term, I offer uh, managing your research data workshop. If it's offered face to face with people, it's a two and a half hour workshop, so quite lengthy. Um, at the moment, everything's online. So it's uh, we're trying to stick to a one hour limit. So this is actually provisioned and provided under our central research excellence training program. And that's made available to staff and to postgraduate research students and they sign up for it. And the focus of that particular workshop is very much about writing data management plans. We also developed an online tutorial, RDM 101, and that's made available within our uh, virtual learning environment. It's designed to get staff and students to think about the data they are working with and how they manage and handle their data well. And because we've been doing everything online for the last year, uh, I've started to develop a lot more asynchronous training. So I've done things like a recording on RDM for supervisors. What I thought would be quite nice, which is not like me, I'm quite known for being quite negative, but I thought during pandemic and in lockdown, it'd be quite useful to talk about some of the successes that we've had, as well as some of the things that are in the pipeline. So these may seem quite small, but actually some of these are quite big for us because 
as Magdalena, we've been in existence and as a team since 2014. And some of these things we've been trying to get to happen since 2014. So I suppose the first uh, success I want to talk about is our kind of data file upload to Pure. So the University of York uses Pure as its current research information system. Um, we've been using Pure to record metadata about retained data sets. So basically we've been using Pure as a data catalogue. And um, researchers who want to deposit their data with the Research Data York service, the first thing they need to do is to create a metadata record in Pure for their data set. Now, we've been trying since 2014 to persuade the business owners of Pure at the university to allow us to switch on data file upload in Pure. And we've recently succeeded. So this is brilliant news. So from now on, our researchers can create not only a metadata record in Pure uh, that's then made uh, publicly visible in something called our York Research Database, but they can also uh, upload their data files directly to Pure at the same time, which means we're not having to do lots of things like emailing people and saying, have you got a data set? Can you transfer it to us? And can you do that by drop off service? So this is really good news. The other thing we've been able to put into place is a transfer of large data files. So we've been very lucky to come across a number of supportive colleagues in IT services and they provided the technical know-how to enable us to make it easy for our researchers to transfer their large data sets to us for deposit. So that's outside of Pure. So at the moment we've got upload of data files in Pure and each file has a limit of no more than two gig. So now we have a temporary folder on a server which we can switch on temporarily to allow a researcher to upload their data files. When they've done that, we switch off that temporary access, we move it into a permanent home, and if it's open data, we make it available for download using something called web files. Another thing that has been put in place while we've been in lockdown is something called a Research Data York Advisory Group. So this is an advisory group giving an advice around all that Research Data York service. And this was really an attempt by me to coordinate areas of activity that cut across functions and different teams in the university that actually kind of feed into this good data management. Um, so what I've done in this group, I've brought together some key individuals to work collaboratively in the advisory group. And the group comprises of myself, someone from information governance, so data protection, someone from IT services, so we've got a research software engineer, and also our digital archivist. And the group, although it's fairly new, is having a positive impact on the services and on researchers' ability to use the service. So as an example, we've made some recommendations about how we handle data with restricted access. And these have been approved by our Open Research Strategy Group. So we're now able to provide clarity about what our research need, researchers need to do if they want to deposit data with Research Data York, but make it restricted access. And the last thing on successes I wanted to report back on, also very new, is an open research advocate network. So my colleague Ben Catt has been working really hard and very successfully. And so far, I think he's recruited about 16 individuals. Now, these are advocates to help promote and support open research practice across a wide range of disciplines at the university. And I see this as a real success. And I'm hoping that what we can do is work in partnership with these advocates, that the advocates will explore the challenges and opportunities for research data management and open data in their discipline, and that this will result in us working together to provide more discipline specific guidance and support. Support. A few other bits and pieces in the pipeline. We need to at some point make a, a very good business critical case to support the funding of a data repository. We haven't got one. Pure really isn't fit for purpose, so I'd like to have one. Um, but that's an ongoing scenario. The DMP review service is just me reviewing plans. If I'm not here, it doesn't happen. Um, so I do hope to bring others in that can actually kind of provide some support around that. And it may be that the Research Data York Advisory Group 
may be able to provide an inroad into that and offer kind of some support around that. And in terms of data wrangling, myself and a colleague are just finishing a, a first phase of a project about supporting researchers with data wrangling. So this is exploring how we might support researchers in terms of uh, kind of data science skills, their data skills. And um, we've um, just finished and published um, a university-wide survey and um, we're identifying the needs and skills gaps that we may need to provide support and provision around. So that's it from me. Um, quite open to take questions. Thank you. I'll uh, stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Lindsay. It was uh, very interesting to hear and so wonderful to see um, how successful you were during pandemic. It feels it really opened like new opportunities for you to collaborate and find new ways of working. Um, we received a question from Madeline. I'm not sure, Madeline, whether you would like to unmute yourself. Yes. Yeah, I was. I was. Um, I was also bring my video on so you can see me. Um, I was wondering um, on what software your data repository is based. Is it an in-house development, or are you using an existing software solution? Yes. Yes, so we, do, we don't have a data repository as such. Mm -hmm. We're using the uh, Pure, which is an Elsevier product. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so we're basically using the um, the Chris uh, at yeah. the moment to do all of this. Um, and this mm -hmm. is what I'm saying. We, we really okay. need to build a business critical case to actually get a data repository. I think that the problems there is there's not much on offer at the moment, and it's difficult to know kind of what's going to actually provide us with a better solution, I suppose, for a data repository. So in essence, we get our researchers to record as they do their other research outputs, their data sets in Pure, so they provide all their metadata. They can now upload their data files to Pure. Mm -hmm. And then we have a public portal called York Research Database. And the metadata and the data is made available for download through that uh, York Research Database, which is our public portal to all our research. It's a bit of a workaround, I have to say, because the York Research Database is um, was provided as a York specific, uh, a customised portal. It's now out of support, um, so we have to do quite a bit of workarounds to actually get our data sets to appear as records, as metadata records on that, and for data set to be downloadable as well. Okay, thank you. We received another question from Rory. Uh, Rory, if you could unmute yourself. Yes, hi. Uh, just following on the same theme, um, you mentioned that uh, you said you, you, just, you described Pure as being not fit for purpose and as you were just discussing, you'd like to move to a data repository. Could you comment on the, the limitations you find with using Pure or trying to use Pure as a data repository? Ooh. Um. Yeah, what do I say about it? I, I suppose in essence, we, I, my understanding is that Pure was bought by the university to support the REF. Oh. So it definitely has that functionality uh, within it for REF, but not for data sets. In terms of metadata, we can't change the records within uh, Pure. They're, they're standardized. There's no customization. Um, so it's very hard to, um, there's no funder field. So we have to try and ensure that researchers provide the links out to the project. They have to link the data set with the project so that we can see that it's actually funded and who it's funded by. I think the main problem with Pure actually is the kind of um, integration with other systems. It sits very much on its own and it's very hard to have that integration with anything else. Um, but on the metadata side, it is really lacking and we can't do anything about that. So it is really this kind of functionality and customization um, and the problems that we've got with this kind of very specific research data, uh, York Research Database, this public portal that again is unsupported and now we can't actually make any changes to it. Um, 
so we'll see where we go. We see where we go from here. You know, we've discussed kind of fixture. There is a, a GIST, so there's a UK offering uh, around a research repository, which is something else to look at. But at the moment, I think um, we have to make a business case for the university to see that this is an important endeavour and something that we need in terms of infrastructure. I suppose the other thing to say, of course, is it won't detract from that kind of culture change of trying to get to get people uh, to think about managing their data well and also sharing their data potentially at the end of a project. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Um, we have another question from Emily, if you would be happy to unmute yourself. Hi. Um, yes, my question, I was, um, I was amazed that you're the only one reviewing the data management plans. Um, I didn't know whether, is it like a mandatory yeah. step for you or are you just getting you know just people opt to do it and what kind of volume are you getting and then also because it's just you when there are like there might be very specific issues that you see in a particular plan do you refer to colleagues like for, you mentioned your information governance colleague I'm, I'm a data protection person um so so that's where I go to but um do you do you like refer to others or are you just trying to you you do your best um like in terms of We've been trying to set up a team and do things collaboratively, and I'm just wondering how it works when it's just you. Yeah, it's, a, it's tricky. Um, so data management plans aren't main mandated by the university. It's not part of the university policy. They are strongly encouraged. And of course, as you know, um, most UK uh, funders do require a data management plan with grant application. Um, so it's not mandated, but we do have some departments that do mandate it so they can see the real value of data management plans. And I've said within that department that anybody who's undertaking research or more specifically that uh, postgraduate research students should develop data management plans. So sometimes there's a bit of a flurry if a department sets a deadline for postgraduate research students to provide their data management plans. So, yeah, at the moment, it is just me. Um, I really sometimes set questions to the people that provide those data management plans if I feel I can't answer specifically around kind of data protection. There are some things I will have a go at, um, but I do advise people to go off and talk to other relevant people as appropriate. And this is where really this kind of research data York advisory group, I think, may bring in other opportunities because we have got somebody from data protection, information governance, IT colleague, somebody from uh, who's a digital archivist. And I'm hoping that we may be able to think around ways of providing more support around that. Um, so that might be an opportunity. Um, but at the moment, it's me saying, oh, have you thought about, oh, this looks a bit iffy, what you're doing here. I really th think you need to go back to your ethics committee or data protection offer to see what they advice that, that they can offer. So I don't know if that answers your question, Emily. But... OK, another question is from Jen, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Hi, Lindsay. Thanks very much for your talk. Um, I'm going to be starting reviewing data management plans, um, maybe with DMP online, I'm not sure yet. Um, and I know that's a specific tool, but talking more generally, I was wondering if you have any advice for how you go about working with the researchers on the data management plans and if there are any particular things that you've picked out over your time doing it that they really like or don't like about doing the data management plans or parts that they particularly struggle with or just any kind of general advice that you would offer for, for doing that? Oh, I don't know whether I can offer advice. Um, I suppose I'd say, the, yeah, the thing I find most tricky is um, I tend to get a lot of data management plans where there are ethical issues, where there are data protection if, issues, and I find these really difficult. And it's steering that line of providing enough information to get a researcher to do something or a postgraduate re student to do something about that. So that's always what I'm trying to do in providing comments and stuff. It's not necessarily giving any answers. It's just saying, oh, you haven't necessarily kind of discussed how you're going to make this data available at the end and how, you know, you're going to anonymize it, et cetera, et cetera. I have found over the years that I have a kind of crib sheet so I have a crib sheet that I keep in Google Docs 
and I just keep kind of standard responses, I always have to kind of re-engineer them in some way. But there are standard things that come up time and time again about, you know, storage of data, usually on the data management plans about people kind of saying they're not going to share any of their data and they haven't given a reason why not to, why they're not going to, or they're going to share it if people ask them for it. So I'm promoting the Research Data York service. So I suppose the one thing I would recommend is perhaps start to draw together all the advice and guidance you're given in a document so at least that kind of cuts down a bit of the time of re-engineering the same kind of responses to similar questions over and over again thank you okay thank you very much another question um, raised was from angeliki okay. yeah. here i am thank you uh, very good uh, talk, uh, Lindsay. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. I have a question regarding the review process that you follow, but you partly answer it on Jen's questions. Question uh, a minute ago. Uh, my question actually is: if you use a specific tool to, uh, let's say, standardize or facilitate the review process, because. Uh, plans uh, uh, come from different disciplines and projects so they have each plan has its own particularities so uh, do you in the actual review process do you uh, evaluate and review the plan against for example the funders uh, template or your in-house uh, in-house template that you have created or you have some core uh, let's say um, standard um, uh, sections that you uh, evaluate the plan against these uh, sections so you, you said that you have created the this google doc with the standard responses which is very reasonable and i believe very useful but apart from that have you developed any a tool specific scoring card or something like that no i haven't and I, I actually don't score i don't score and i never say um that actually the what I'm providing will actually mean that it, it meets that funder requirements. All I'm ever saying is that I'm providing feedback. So I'm providing feedback, so I'm identifying where I see there's missing items or things they may want to tweak. So I don't have a scorecard. I have in the past used the um, the rubrics that have been developed by the Digital Creation yeah. Centre, um, but I don't do a scoring mechanism because I don't want to get into that scenario necessarily where they say oh well Lindsay checked this over and she said it it was fine um and therefore it should be okay with the funder um so the the main push in terms of data management plans and this is has been kind of fairly recent is very much to push researchers to use dmp online so they're using the most up-to-date standard template for their funder and we provide customized guidance from the university and we're pushing people also to use that guidance from the dcc uh, and the guidance from the funder within that We've got our own template, so if people are unfunded, then they can fill that in, and there's lots of guidance around that. Actually, probably too much guidance. Um, if you have a look at it on, uh, and then be really good to get your feedback on it, but there's loads of guidance in there, and I worry that there's actually too much. So, But I don't do a scoring mechanism. It is very much just uh, I'm providing feedback on it. Here's where I think you could improve your plan. Here's some ideas around what you could do with your data and how you could share it at the end of your project, but not a scoring mechanism. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know whether there are any further questions for Lindsay. Uh, I can't see any in the chat. But feel free to unmute yourself if you wish. If not, I would like to say thank you to Lindsay. We we can continue with the session, uh, but thank you, Lindsay, for answering all all the questions and for your presentation. Um, I think we can just continue with the updates, and um, you can have questions for us, anything in relation to DMP online. So, um, we I don't know, Patricia, do you want to start or I can. Yeah. Um... 
So um, it's not been that long since we actually had our, uh, yeah, our, our last session of these, uh, which was basically just after um, the, the upgrade we did. Um, Magdalena now has put uh, the uh, the release notes together that uh, gives an overview of all the new um, features and functionalities that um, came with the uh, with the upgrade. So uh, that was an infrastructure upgrade, but also uh, brought in new um, some of the latest developments on the shared roadmap uh, code base that we have. Um, we can put that link again in the uh, in the chat. Um, so you can uh, read up on uh, all the bits that have changed. Um, as with uh, most major upgrades, they rarely go super smoothly, even if you test everything before. So um, thank you for uh, thanks to everyone who has reported uh, various issues and hiccups in the system. Um, since then, uh, we. Um, are working through the the all the list of of bugs that have been reported, um, and we've also created a, a little uh, wiki page uh, for you to to have an overview of um, what is currently in the pipeline to be fixed. Um, because we we like know that like our um, our help desk is like not visible to anyone other uh, uh, else. So it's, um, which is usually fine, but uh, if it's a, a big system upgrade where many people have like reported same issues um, or um, found bits and a bit of an overview is quite nice. So um, thanks to, to Magdalena who has put a, a little a wiki page together that gives an overview of all the things that we are aware of. Um, and are in uh, uh, addressing um, uh, at the moment. Um, yeah, um, one question from uh, Madeleine around how the raw integration works. Um, at the moment, that's literally just pulling in things from raw without doing, um, much about it. What we have on our list is uh, a tidy up task, basically, because um, you might see that quite a few institutions are in there twice. And sometimes when you pick yours, you pick the wrong one first. Um, so uh, we do have that on our list to, to tidy up and basically kick out the ones that aren't actually used, but keep the ones in the system that are linked to the actual um, institutions in the system. Um, yeah, that's that's still a step to do um, for us because it pulls in quite a, well. It pulls in the whole raw database, which is basically every institution that's uh, listed in raw, which is um, and an overkill for um, for most people. So uh, we know we need to tidy that up um, um, and, and hope to get around to that soon. I don't know if that answers uh, your question, Madeline, or if you have like uh, more queries around that. Um, yeah, great. If not, um, um, feel free to, um, yeah, Send send things like that uh, into us, uh, or um, and we'll we'll try to um, answer and address things and add them to the list. Um, I don't know, Magdalena, if you want to talk about uh, customizations, um, or shall I cover that as well? Um, I can I can just mention it quickly. Um, we will we'll be answering the questions um, as we go as well. So there are a few more questions coming through as well. I'll I'll just mention the change of customization. So um, we we are changing the process a little bit, and we'll be also then 
sharing the updated welcome pack for those that will be affected by this new change. Uh, what we uh, realized uh, recently with customization for the enhanced clients, so that means instead of seeing the orange colors, for example, you are able to apply your institutional colors, you can set up your, your own URL and text on the pages. Um, what we found out recently in the process is that we will need to introduce uh, further steps uh, for the customers and that's to do the user acceptance testing of the pages doing uat for the pages and um, we'll be putting together a video and explaining how to go about it so if there are certain i don't know mistakes or things you still want to pick up on these can be picked up on early on um, because without doing the UAT we appeared in a situation where a week after a week we would get requests to do further changes and of course we want to do this but we always need to plan these quite in advance so we will introduce a system where you can come back to us with whatever you still want to change once and then we will implement and put the customized page to go live if there will be any further changes you didn't pick up on earlier on um, this will just go at the bottom of the priority list and we'll wor wor work through that but we will be putting together the guidance so you can ensure that the pages look well uh, before they go live so hopefully that will help to all um so there were questions i think from wayne attempting to access guidance results in page unavailable is it covered yes uh this is a known issue um i think we internally try to put them in certain order so there is the plan notifications not coming through um, that is currently worked as a priority at the moment, followed by, uh, I can't remember from the top of my head, I can check internally what we said. I know the guidance is just third in the line uh, to be worked on, so we are aware of this and uh, we'll be working on it. Sharing plan is the second one we are working on. So anything to do with plans, we, we want to ensure you are receiving the emails when the feedback is requested. And, um, you know, that sharing a plan from a researcher will not throw an error message. And then, of, of course, we want to ensure the guidance works as well. But, you know, that's based on the priorities at the moment. That's the third one in the line. Um, Yes, so I think I also answered Tip's question for some institution, the feedback email is not going through. We, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we are having still the notification on the pages. If not, I'll just uh, reapply the notification to the MP online pages so all the users can see it. Um, and, you know, if they just click um, to remove the notification, can be removed but if this was already removed from the MP online I apologize um, and I'll just put it back so everyone is informed we were having it there over the past two weeks now I think so um I guess in general can um can say that if you track if you have put in an email and a ticket with us you will definitely get an answer when it's um fixed because then we're basically going back to everyone so if you want to notification um that that's uh probably the best way to know to to um yeah get an um the immediate note that uh, a certain thing has been addressed um the other thing is that uh, we had um issues like around shibboleth and they, they weren't issues for all institutions so sometimes it seems to be that certain things work for some institutions but aren't an issue across um, um, or uh, issues for some institutions but aren't an issue across the board um so it is like you know it happens that we think we fix it for everyone and then there are still hiccups so if something isn't working for you it's better to let us know um than just sitting there and hoping that that will be um, addressed. Usually it is like a generic issue that we 
pick up, especially if it's a big thing like this. But if if there are like sometimes if you notice something isn't as usual, it's don't hesitate to ask. You know, that's why we're here. And uh, uh, for and sometimes it's really just uh, it requires digging because it's something that works for everyone else, but not for your institution. Sometimes it's a general issue, then we can fix it for everyone in one go. Um, but yeah, uh, if you if you could put an email in uh, around that, that would be um, great. I hope it's not like at the moment it's a long list, so I know that like you know it might be annoying to write an email about every single issue when you know that the list um, that the list is long and you don't get uh, um, the the issue addressed immediately. But in in general, don't hesitate to put. Um, issues in emails to us. And that's the best way to make sure that you um, get the notification once it's something addressed. And it's also actually really helpful for us to understand if that's an issue that's affecting the, a wide range of, uh, of customers. Because if like five for you reported, then we can be pretty sure that that's something that, you know, doesn't work for anyone. Um, so don't hesitate to, to get that in. Um, yeah, helpful for us um, and also best, best way for you to uh, get the immediate notification of uh, and the, the fix when it's there. Mm -hmm. um... Yeah, so I, I can just, uh, we can just share a few links with you. Um, the February 2021 newsletter is out. So if you're not subscribed, do subscribe. And I think if Patricia is kind enough, she'll, she'll put all the links to the chat. Um, also, the February recording um, is already live. And we do have the playlist of all drop-in sessions in a YouTube channel. And so feel free uh, to watch some older ones if you wish. I would like to welcome you to all take part um, in the survey about our next demo session. Last day uh, is today to take part. It, there are only two questions really to answer. Um, and based on your answers, we'll be able to prioritize um, the next demo sessions to come over the few, few months or We'll see how much responses we get probably the following six months, I would say. Um, and as always, um, if you wish to be our next guest speaker, uh, get in touch with us at dmponline at dcc.ac.uk. I'm not sure whether uh, there are any more questions. Feel free to unmute yourself or drop a line in the chat. There is something uh, might be helpful for DMP online if institution could add tick to share document if they're experiencing problem with problems problems in your bug list. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering where to. Uh, I think that that's uh, that's like currently the. Um, we need to figure out how to best do that because our our the so the issues for the things that are like DMP online specific are private. A Google Doc would be the way. So ideally, like our uh, um, for roadmap, as as you can see, most of the things like um, are visible on um, on GitHub, uh, which is also where we put the list of bugs. Uh, Google Doc um, could be a way to do it. That next time we do, um, yeah, a, a bigger update. I'm just trying to be mindful here that we're not creating too many documents that we're never that we forget to check and update though. But yeah, I I, I totally get the point. That's something that is. Um, visible and where you can easily say also a problem for me or upvote or something uh, in, in uh, an easy way uh, would be good. We'll have a think. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so so we, we we realized that that that's like needed and would be really useful. I just haven't found an easy, nice, smart way to do it yet. No, no, we can discuss. Um, yeah. be, you know, having something more responsive, probably, especially for this big upgrade. Um, but yeah, I think we'll need to discuss this um, offline. Um, so I don't know whether there are any further questions or suggestions or anything else you would like to raise. If not, um, I would like to say big thank you to Patricia, um, as always, and to Lindsay for our be for our guest speaker today. Um, thank you very much. Thank you to all who joined us today and stayed with us till now. Um, do not forget to follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, um, and subscribe to our monthly newsletter. We tend to announce our upcoming sessions there. Um, just so you know, the next drop-in meeting is going to be on the 22nd of April, half past 10 in the morning. I just realized um, it is also the last day for RDA, for those who are attending. Uh, Patricia and Alex and I think other colleagues from DCC are organizing, so um, I think they're going to be very, very busy on that day. Uh, but I'll try to ask to other colleagues, if possible, to join me on the day to run the session. Um, we will be joined by Irina van Dijk for, from UMC Utrecht. And like I mentioned, um, you know, um, if you haven't registered yet, feel free to register for the IDCC conference, which will be next month between on the 19th of April, just for one day this time around. Uh, because um, in Edinburgh, we are also running the RDA 17th plenary meeting uh, between 20th and 22nd of April. So again, um, if you're interested, I think Patricia just shared the links with you there as well. So do join us and thanks to all and have a lovely rest of today. Thank you. Bye bye.